summer this morning. Lord, we just thank you for all the good you've done in our lives. We just thank you that you are the way maker, the promise keeper, the miracle worker. You are the one who we can trust in. Lord, we are all fallen, fragile human beings. Our lives on this earth will be short, but we can trust in you. And so, Lord, as we get into your word this morning, we just pray that you would work powerfully through what your word says to challenge us, to help us to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the topic of gluttony, and we really delved into some real depth. We looked at the forms, the dangers, and the slain of gluttony. In fact, we looked at it the week before that as well, and we looked at just how bad this sin for you and how obesity can really bring destruction into your lives. And it's possible that there were some people who were listening either here or online who were maybe a little bit offended about some of the stuff that we talked about in that sermon, maybe even a little bit rankled. So it's really fitting that today we're going to talk about wrath, one of the other seven deadly sins. See, one of the good things about talking about the seven deadly sins is that it highlights just how sinful and wicked we really are. And I know that sounds counterintuitive. I mean, shouldn't you talk only about the positive things? You know, you got to latch on to the affirmative, accentuate the positive, and I got the word completely wrong, and don't mess with mischief in between. You know that song? you got to, I, I can't do it without singing it, so I'm just not going to do it. But isn't that what people want to do? They really, <laughs> that's what people want to do. They really want to focus on the positive. But hearing about our sinfulness is good for us because it is true, and we can only get our lives on the right track by using truth. That is the only way we can learn to live the right way. And a lot of people say, you know, speak the truth in love. The Bible says to speak the truth in love. And it is true, we are supposed to speak the truth in love. But when many people say it, what they actually mean is, don't speak the truth because you'll offend. That's how most people, when they say that statement, that's what, they, that's what they're intending when they say it. That's not what the Bible means. That's what people do. They're, they're trying to get you to stop saying something. But to speak the truth in love, what that really means is, whether harshly or not, to speak the truth in such a way that it is, you have the best intentions for the person that you're challenging. That's what it means to speak the truth in love. You have that person's best interests at heart. That's, in essence, what it means. I mean, last week, Luther told us that we're all fat clouds in big green pastures of clover. Remember that? He told us that last week, spiritually speaking, the church said it is a fat cows sitting in a big green pasture. Now, Luther didn't just say that to get some laughs. He said it because it's true. And because it's good for us to hear that, how we have had it way too good for too long. And Luther was absolutely correct about that. We about this, These good times are coming to the end and we're not really prepared for them. The times, they are changing as another old song says. You know, the post-World War II generation, that is the baby boomer generation, they were given the most ethnically homogenous and therefore socially cohesive society in, his, in, in Western history, religiously unified, financially prosperous society in the history of the world. No generation had ever had it better, had never had any more wealth. House prices were low, and in comparison, incomes were high, and goods and services were cheap. Most of the products were made here, and we made some awesome stuff. Every single one of those things was made here. And yes, I put Fords and Holdens up there because they're both Aussie. <laughs> but, uh, you know, not that long ago, a man could work on the factory floor just bolting onto the particular machine or, or car that he was working on, that particular part or the particular line that he was on, and he would earn enough to provide for his whole family, his wife didn't have to work, and his kids were healthy and fed well. It was the peak of our civilization's success. Now that generation squandered all of that society and will hand on to their children an ethnically divided society, the highest highest house prices in history, the cost of living is now incredibly high, and worse than all of that, all of the Christian capital of those previous generations has been squandered with endless controversies. 
the easy life of the past generations is quickly dissipating. It is disappearing. And in the US, it's even worse than it is here. And Australia, generally speaking, follows the US. Five or ten years after the US goes down a particular route, we follow down that same route. This means that we are about to enter a hard time. It's just a simple fact. It may not be the hardest time in history, but it's certainly going to be harder than the last few decades have been. Those green pastures are drying up. The clover has taken them over and our whole society, society has been poisoned. And in this context, a better understanding of our sinfulness and why we need to deal with it is incredibly necessary. You see, as society gets more openly wicked and anti-God and, and pressure intensifies, the church is going to come under more and more scrutiny and more and more criticism, both from within and without. We are entering very uncertain times. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but that's okay. Because we know who is really in control, don't we? At the end of the day, God is in control. And hard times are the church's chance to shine. That is what God wants the church to do in hard times. So with all that being said, we're going to delve into the sin of wrath today because Anger can be our great undoer. Even an incredibly righteous man can be brought down <laughs> by one uncontrolled burst of anger. This is a mortal sin if there ever was one. But what I want to start by doing is looking at the positive side to anger. So we read in Ecclesiastes 3 verses 1 to 8, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather Stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. You know, many, another way of saying many of these things is there is a time for anger and a time to not be anger, especially the last two. Anger is a complicated emotion because it can repel people even when it is done in a righteous way. And there is, there is such thing as a righteous anger. I mean, Jesus got angry at several different points that we see in the Gospels in his ministry. Remember the cleansing of the temple. Jesus cleansed the temple twice, made a whip and drove people out. He got incredibly furious at the oppression that he saw that was centered around what was supposed to be the house of God and a house of prayer. He got incredibly angry. His anger at the Pharisees is famous. And child abusers made Jesus furious. It says this in Matthew 18, verses 5 to 6. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, the Greek actually says causes to stumble, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. See, in this passage, Jesus is supporting the death penalty for those who harm children because it's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly wicked and evil. And think about this. Nothing causes a child to stumble more than being abused by someone, especially someone they trusted. It's a crime that often and often does perpetuate itself. Often those who are abused go on to be abusers. Not always, but often. Jesus told us how to deal with such people, but what does our society do? Often just slaps them on the wrist and lets them go a few years later. It's despicable. Jesus' angry at the Pharisees was legendary. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within you, within you are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you, full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! I like what one preacher said once. These words are in red for a reason. For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would have not taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? These are the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 23, 23. And he was furious at the way that the religious leaders had oppressed the Israelites and the corruption 
You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Jesus expressed righteous anger in doing this. And Paul also got righteously angry in his ministry. He tells us in Galatians that when Peter was engaged in dangerous practices, this is what he says. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. <laughs> he got up in his face. You know, these are Middle Easterners, you know, that, that, kind, that, sort, that part of the world, you know, where Israel and Palestine and Turkey, you know, when those people get passionate, they get passionate. <laughs> and still to this day, he got in Peter's face because he was furious because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Paul was angry. And he, ex he expresses righteous anger in many parts of his writings. For example, at false apostles, at false teachers, at people causing divisions, at people practicing wicked behaviors. Paul was a mighty man of God and he expressed appropriate anger at wicked actions often. And some of the angry things that he said are incredibly famous and incredibly harsh. For example, Galatians 5, 7 to 12. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. In other words, what he's saying is, I wish they would take the knife and cut the whole thing off. That's Paul, in the Bible, expressing anger at people who are teaching false doctrine. That's pretty harsh. <laughs> so we see that anger is a human emotion, and it can be, be expressed harshly and still be righteous. The question is, do you have the person's best interest at heart? That is the important thing. Indeed, it was Paul who gave us our most clear teaching that anger itself is not sin. Galatians 4, 20, sorry, Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 27. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak with truth, speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. This is a famous verse. In your anger, do not sin, is how most people remember it. I think that's how the King James writes it. But this is in the context. Notice the context. The context is about challenging someone who's been speaking falsehood, or in the context of falsehood, speaking the truth and being angry, but in your anger, do not sin. So there is a righteous anger, and there are many righteous things to be angry at. One of them we've already talked about. Child abuse is something which should make us angry. The fact that there are credible, constant accusations of child abuse coming out of pedo—what I mean, Hollywood—constantly should make us angry, <coughs> right? The disgusting Netflix show *Cuties* should make us angry. I'm glad I deleted my Netflix account a couple of years ago. It was last, early last year. It's just—it's just horrific. That sort of stuff should make us righteously angry. The corruption of power-hungry governments should make us angry. Premiers hiding behind bureaucrats to shield themselves from criticism should make us angry. Premiers lying about why they are putting in certain restrictions should make us angry. Indeed, this whole society-wide overreaction to what is happening right now should upset us. Endless, stupid wars should upset us and should make us angry. Look at that. That's just one field. Think about this, right? America invaded Afghanistan and Iraq because some mostly Saudi terrorists who ended up being found in Pakistan attacked the trade towers. How many levels of dumb is that? Endless stupid wars that are still going on today. How long have we been in Afghanistan now? Since 2001? 20, it's insane. That is insane. Corruption in the church should anger us, should make us furious. The predatory nature of debt lords, also known as banks, should anger us. It really should. 
The perversion of marriage in our modern culture should make us angry. The, the death of the unborn. The murder of the unborn in the womb should anger us. Abortion far exceeds many other travesties in the already horrible 20th century where many people were killed in horrible ways. Abortion far exceeds even that. The righteous are right to get angry at wickedness. In fact, here's a good example in the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 to 8. And if he, that is God, rescued Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw in her. What was the righteous man Lot's response to the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah around him? He was tormented in his righteous soul. He was greatly distressed at the sensual conduct of the wicked. He was angry to his bones, in other words, and furious at the harm that was being caused and the dishonoring of God that was being practiced. The key is, though, we need to be slow to anger, and in your anger, do not sin. Proverbs 14, verse 29, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. We need to be wise in our expression of anger because there are many righteous reasons to be angry. And because if we're not, our wrath can end up in destruction. Now, there are many passages in the Bible which talk about the danger of wicked wrath. Here's some examples. Proverbs 15, verse 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man. Proverbs 27, verse 4. Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? Proverbs 29, 22. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and one given to anger causes much transgression. All of these passages teach us the dangers of being given over to anger too quickly and too harshly. It can wreak destruction in our lives and the lives of those around us. And I love what Chaucer has to say about this in the Canterbury Tales. Read this with me. The sin of anger, according to St. Augustine, is a wicked determination to be avenged by word or deed. You see the difference between that and what we looked at before? Righteous anger has the best interest of the person you're angry at at heart. Unrighteous anger is the unrighteous desire to be avenged, to get vengeance by what you do or say. <laughs> and it puts within him, the person who's angry, the likeness of the devil and takes the man away from God, his rightful Lord. For certainly, just as fire is the mightiest of earth engines of destruction, so ire is mightiest to destroy things spiritual. Certainly this cursed sin injures both the man who does it and his neighbor, for truly almost all of the harm that any man does to his neighbor comes from wrath. Is this not a cursed vice? Yes, certainly, alas, it takes from man his wit and his reason and all the kindly spiritual life that should guard his soul. Certainly it takes away also God's due authority, and that is man's soul and love of his neighbor." See what unrighteous anger does? Unrighteous anger makes us like the devil who is constantly given over to anger. Unrighteous anger also causes us to harm others and seek vengeance on others. And most of what we do which harms others comes from the sin of anger, does it not? It steals away our ability to think, doesn't it? When someone is given over to anger, it destroys all of their reasoning ability. It's like they are, that's why they say, a mindless rage. And it causes us to throw off God's authority. Truly, truly it is a deadly sin. You know, there isn't a person who committed murder who didn't meditate on it first and think about it and think about it and let the anger stoke up inside of them, inside of them, and continually and continually they didn't deal with it. And then, in a moment of anger, they lashed out. You know, very few murders are committed by emotionless psychopaths. That's just something Hollywood likes to show us. You know what most murders are? They're a, a, a crime of passion. 
an act of vengeance and anger in the moment. It's the reason why when a woman or a man is killed, usually the first person they interview is their spouse. Jesus told us, You have heard that it was said of them of, of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of, of the judgment, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And John tells us that if we hate our brother in our heart, we have already committed murder in our heart in his little epistle. You know, if you sat down and spoke with many people in jail, many murderers, you would find that they're there because they couldn't control their anger. They stoked it and stoked it, and one day they lashed out, and now someone they know, or someone they loved, or someone who just happened to be in their way is now dead. That's how dangerous this sin can be. Our anger can be a temporary loss of control that can impact both our lives and the lives of somebody else for the rest of their life. How many of you wish you could take back something that you said in anger? All of us do. I myself am a pretty outspoken person. I'm not afraid to say what I think. And because of that, there are many things I wish I could take back. <laughs> we all do. We've all spoken in anger. Unrighteous anger overrides all our abilities to think rationally. All it wants is satisfaction. And that's why it makes us so much like the devil when, when you're given to it, because it makes you think that you are the judge, the jury, and the punisher. But we are not that, are we? That's not our job. We are not the judge, the jury, and the punisher. You know, there's a great story in the, in the Grimm's fairy tales, it's called the, the tale of, uh, the, the, it's called the tailor in heaven. And it's really cool. It's just, you know those jokes, St. Peter jokes? You've heard the St. Peter jokes and Peter's standing at the gate? I wonder if this is one of the origins. Because <laughs> it starts off, St. Peter was standing at the gate. And one day God, wanted, God wished to go out. And so he said to St. Peter, look, I want you to watch, watch the room because I'm going to go out for a while. And then this tailor who came along and basically said to St. Peter, I want to come into heaven. And Peter said, look, you can't come in. You've been wicked. You've been deceitful. You've done a lot of wrong. I can't let you in here. And he's like, come on, please, please. I've come so far. Please just let me sit in the corner, and I'll stay here in the corner, and I'll just leave everybody alone. And so St. Peter lets him sit just on a seat just by the door, just waiting there. And then St. Peter wanders off, and the tailor sits there for a while, and he gets bored. So he starts to wander around, and then he walks into the throne room and he sees the throne of God and he thinks, oh wow, this is incredible, this is wonderful and he sits on the seat and he realizes that he, he's got, he sits on the seat, he puts his feet on the footstool and he realizes that he can see everything from this throne on the earth. And it says that he sees this old woman and she was sitting there and she was stealing from others and she was thieving and stealing and sinning and he got so angry at this woman that he picked up the stool and threw it down at her, down at the earth. And then God came back, and he saw that the stool wasn't there. And this is what it says. <laughs> then the Lord had the tailor brought before him and asked him if he'd taken away the stool where he'd put it. O oh Lord, answered the tailor joyously, I, th I threw it in my anger at, to the earth at an old woman who I saw stealing two veils while washing. Are you knave, said the Lord, were I to judge as you judge? How do you think you could have escaped judgment for so long? I should have no chairs, benches, seats, stay, not even fire tongs, for I would have thrown everything on sinners long ago. <laughs> now you can stay no longer in heaven, but must go out the door again. Then go where you will. No one shall give punishment here, but I, the Lord, alone. How good is that? What's that story telling us? That if God lashed out in his anger like fallen human beings do, we would have all been squashed a long time ago. But he is much more merciful than us. Much more merciful than us in showing forgiveness and mercy and giving us time. And we should do that for others as well. We should do the same. So how do we slay this sin? Well, we slay it by practicing 
patience. We practice patience, we practice kindness, and we practice giving. I just need the clicker back on the screen. We practice patience and giving our feelings and our hurts about unjust things that have happened to us over to God. Galatians 5, 16 and 22 to 24 says this, But I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In other words, what do we need? We need to rely on the Spirit of God that is in us. We need to rely on His presence and power in our lives. Without the power of the Spirit in our lives, we will find it hard, in fact, impossible to slay any sin, including the sin of anger. So you, may not, you might not struggle with anger so much. It might be for you something different. But whatever it is, we need to rely on God. So what does it mean to rely on the Spirit? Well, it means to fill your minds with the things of the Spirit. For example, to spend time in God's Word, to read God's Word and to study it and to see how the Spirit would have us live. Prayer. Cast all your burdens on Jesus because He cares for you. Worship. Worshiping Him. Spending time in God's beautiful creation and seeing the wondrous works of His hands. These things help you to put your anger into perspective and to recognize that the God of justice is capable of dealing with that which makes you angry. You also need to cut things out of your life, or at least limit them, those things which make you too angry. The other day I went for a walk. I like to take India for a walk, and I'll often listen to podcasts while I walk. Uh, and th this day, I was, a few days ago, I was just listening to the Bolt Report. I like to listen to the Bolt Report. I think as far as, I don't watch the news. I don't like to watch the news, but every now and then I'll listen to it. And I kind of think that Andrew Bolt is one of the few sane voices. That's my own opinion. If you disagree, that's fine. But anyway, I, I turned it on this day, and I turned it off almost straight away again <laughs> because what he was saying was just making me angry. Everything he was saying was true. Everything he was saying was good and honest. He was talking about stuff like with, to do with China and, and Victoria and all sorts of different stuff. And it was just making me angry. I'm like, you know what? I just don't, I just don't want to hear this right now. And so I just turned it off and I just walked my dog and spent some time in peace. You know, if stuff is making you angry, sometimes you've got to limit it. You've got to cut it out. Switch it off for a while. If your job makes you angry and you are taking it out on your family constantly, maybe it's time for a new job. Maybe it's time to look elsewhere. Maybe you need to persevere. But some men really carry the hurts of their job home and take it out on their family. And this can leave scars on their children for the rest of their life. If your family makes you angry and you need to talk to someone about it, you need to take it to someone that you trust and you need to work through it. You cannot let it build because letting your anger build is like shaking a bottle of carbonated water. Eventually it'll explode. If the shows that you watch make you angry, then maybe your TV should look like this. <laughs> if the company that you keep is making you angry, if the people that you surround yourself with, whatever it is, don't bottle it up. Don't hold on to it. Don't let it continue to influence your life if it's stealing your joy. Look, it's good to have righteous anger, but if it's too much, it can go from righteous to unrighteous and then wicked wrath, and it can really take away from your life. It might be time to change all of them. If the state of the world makes you angry, and like I said earlier on in, in the sermon, there is a good righteous anger at the state of the world, but if it is getting to you too much, and if it's causing you to get too stressed or even sick, which stress can do, stress is one of the major causes of people getting sick, then just remember this, it's not our jobs to rule the world, is it? It's not your job, it's not my job. Who rules the world? God. He's the, he's, he's the king, right? And while the petty, fake, pretend God, the devil, might be causing a lot of trouble, God's got his number, and he'll deal with him, and he'll deal with all of the unrighteous acts that have happened to us and done by us. Sometimes we just need to let let it go. <laughs> if you're under stress, 
You need to find ways to mitigate that stress. You know, take a walk through nature. Just looking at that picture makes me peaceful. Imagine the real thing. Our world is beautiful. God has created many wondrous scenes for us. There are many ways that you can deal with stress. Maybe you need to take a walk through nature. Maybe you need to spend some time with friends. Maybe you just need to switch off for a while. You know, read a light book. I love the classics. You might like something else. Find a way to just mitigate it so it doesn't take over your life. Because if you don't deal with it, and it builds up, you might snap. And who knows what's going to happen if you snap. I can't remember the name of the movie, but there was this movie in the, in the early 90s that had Michael Douglas in it. And he was just playing like an ordinary guy. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it, I remember he, he had like a, white, a black tie on, like a white shirt and like funny looking glass. He just looked like an average office worker at the air and he was... It, the movie's all about him just having a bad day, he's having struggles with his wife, and then he gets caught in traffic, and then he gets angry and stuff happens, and then he snaps and goes on a rampage. Do you see, remember that movie? You probably would if you saw it. I, I should, should have done a little bit of research and got you the title of it to help you out, <laughs> or put a picture on the screen. But that story is real. Because that happens every day. Because people don't deal with their anger. Our guiding passage for this series has been 1 John 5, verses 1 to 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar and his words are not in us. If this is an issue for you, don't pretend that it's not. Bring it into the light. Talk to someone you trust, talk to a friend, talk to your pastor, talk to one of the elders, talk to someone at church, talk to someone you trust and deal with this. And make sure that it's somebody who's not going to be afraid to challenge you and to continue to challenge you. you know, there are people in jail cells. There are people in lonely homes. There are people in broken relationships who really wish that they'd dealt with their anger a lot sooner. That's the reality of this deadly sin. See, anger is an emotion that God created for us to have just like he has at times, but we must remember that we are fallen and so we have to keep from things that anger us too much. We need to be slow to anger, quick to overlook wrongs. Love covers a multitude of sins. And remember, this sin can kill you. Stress is one of the leading causes of death in the world today. It can kill you. It really is, in many ways, one of the deadly sins. So I'm not going to lie this morning. There's been times when I've gotten angry and deeply regretted what I said. We all have. All of the seven deadly sins have tripped us all up in some degree or another at some time. What we need to do is we need to help each other fight these sins. God wants us to be powerful witnesses for him. And like I said, we're about to enter into really hard times in this, in this culture that is coming. You can all sense it, can't you? We can all see what's happening. Pressure is intensifying. And when pressure intensifies, what happens? People get angry. And so we need to work really hard to make sure that we deal with this so we can be the witnesses that God has called us to be in this culture. And to do that, we need to help each other to iron each other out. Iron sharpens iron. And we need God's grace more than we even realize. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for wise Christians who wrote things down long ago to help us to learn from them. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us in this issue with anger in our lives. Lord, I just pray for each and every single one of us here, Lord, that when the pressure is intensifying, that you would help us to find healthy ways to deal with it. 
When it's becoming too much, I just pray that you would help us to find ways to switch off or to mitigate it. And Lord, more than anything else, help us to remember that you are in control and you show mercy. And we thank you that you show mercy. <laughs> help us also to show mercy. In Jesus' name.